the session. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity. And this session is about managing security dilemma, the geopolitical reality. So uh, before I uh, formally start, let me introduce uh, our uh, panelists today. Um, so we have distinguished panelists from both Nepal and India. Uh, so we have Binoz Basnet, retired Army uh, Major General, Nepal Army. And we have General, uh, Brigadier General Kesar Badu Bhandari, retired Nepal Army. And he's also Secretary General of Nepal Institute for Strategic Studies. Uh, also, we have Dr. Nihar Naik. He has been writing a lot on Nepal issues, and he's with IDSA, a think tank based in New Delhi. And also, we have uh, another participant, guest speaker uh, from India, Konstantin Ojevier. He's a fellow at Foreign Policy at Brookings, India. Uh, we have uh, Geza Sarma Wagle. He's security and strategic affairs expert, and he's also columnist in Kantipur Delhi. He writes in different uh, newspapers. Also, we have Samir Patil. He's a fellow, National Security Studies and, direct, and Director, Center for International Security, Gateway House. And this session is being chaired by Dr. Rajan Bhatrai. Um, uh, he's the member of Eminent Person Group. And also, he was a Foreign Affairs Advisor to former Prime Minister Madhav Kumar Nepal. And he's a senior leader of CPN uh, UML Former. Now, it's a Communist Party of Nepal. So the, our topic is security dilemma. Let me just uh, briefly contextualize this question because uh, security dilemma is, is a concept that realist thinkers talk about in international relation. It's about uh, like each countries are always like they are preoccupied with the sense of insecurity and they always try to enhance their power so that they are secure. But this security concept has changed over time because we used to talk about territorial security before. But since this uh, you know, idea is like broadening and deepening of this concept, you know, this uh, concept now embraces so many different things. And it talks about human security, it talks about in environmental security, it talks about energy security. Now we have also started talking about cyber security and many other things. So this is a very uh, broad concept. Uh, but since uh, we have like geopolitical reality, our theme is managing security dilemma, geopolitical reality. So we'll be talking about how uh, you know, geopolitical reality of the South Asia is changing. And also, the geopolitical reality, to be precise, like India's, uh, India and Nepal is also changing uh, in recent years, especially with the rise of China and China showing you know, uh, its interest towards South Asia. It is trying to you know, uh, increase its influence. And also, within Nepal, we can see like there is aspiration. We used to have, like, we used to have uh, you know, good connectivity with India, but we didn't have any uh, good connectivity as such with China. But uh, due to various events uh, in the recent past, uh, now there's an aspiration that we need to have enhanced connectivity with China, and we're also talking about bringing, you know, railway, uh, establishing railway connectivity and other things. And this obviously has kind of, you know, increased security dilemma to, uh, you know, our neighbors. So that is the situation. So we'll be talking about this. We have like distinguished speaker. So what I'm planning to do is I will uh, give like six minute time for each of uh, each speakers because we are already running solo time. Uh, and uh, I will try to take few questions from the participant because this is normally we used to take uh, question. So I will see like if we can take like few questions, two or three questions. And then I'll be giving uh, this floor to chair and chair will uh, you know, answer the question and I'll sum up, uh, conclude this session. So, without much delay, now I would like to, um, yeah, uh, with the consent from chair, so I would like to open this session now, um, and I would invite uh, Binus Basnet, sir, uh, to begin uh, to, to say light on this theme and just recommend the measures how we can manage security dilemma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Koirala, for the, and thank you, NITTS 2018, for inviting me. And I want to also congratulate AIDIA and the NMML for the initiative taken to bring thinkers, strategists, and planners uh, on this track 1.5, identifying bilateral challenges and uh, independent proposals to enhance the already existing good relationship. 
adding to what my colleagues had said in the earlier um, panels, I want to set the stage for this afternoon's discussions and give just a quick geostrategic picture, trends of geopolitics, and a way forward in the next six minutes or seven minutes, maybe. Let me start off with the question. So will the 21st century see a new Asian order for shaping of the emerging new global political order? The magnitude of the Asian order will occupy a fundamental part. Next slide, please. Policy of the United States in the Indo-Pacific, policy of the rising China, resurgent Russia, and most importantly, rising India, as well as Pakistan, and the other nation states under the arc of the Himalayas. United States has three feeders very visible. One is the strengthening security arrangements through partnership and alliances. Two, it is positioning competitive diplomacy with a larger use of economic tools like fair and reciprocal trade agreements and sanctions. Three, the economy is a component of United, Nations, United States national power. Slide, please. And China's geopolitical theory, the string of pearls, two, economic or geoeconomics development and geopolitical influence through the BRI. Now, talking of the BRI, let's talk about the six corridors we are most concerned significantly of the nation state in the South Asian region. One is the projects that ne Nepal will en en encompass as part of the BRI, the CPEC, and Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar corridor. As I told you earlier, the significance of India is visible from time to time and it stresses on from look east policy to act east policy. At the same time, India has time and again developed informal channels with China. And the unfinished first neighborhood policy, indicating an inclination to a rebalancing approach. Next slide, please. The containment of China by the United States and the allies is very visible. The last six months have witnessed global and great powers of diplomatic and geopolitical maneuvering in the Indo-Pacific, which provides a manifesto for either a shift in geopolitics or a conflict in configuring international order. The latest one, BRICS, that was held earlier, and the upcoming BIMSTEC this 30 and 31st August. The trends of geopolitics and politics has also observed strategic shifts below the Himalayas, per per perceiving four geopolitical trends and two political trends as on the slide. Now let me conclude with two way forward. Adopt 3T political theory with three effects unquestionably stood out in geopolitical and geoeconomics when priorities were addressed on the visits conducted by PM Oli in the recent past. Number one is trust. China, India, Nepal needs each other in the first and most important. Sino-Indian relationship is very good and shares encouraging and constructive, many times dissimilar to the one portrayed. So trust in security, trust in diplomacy, trust in political, pol political and participation, political trust, trust in professionalism and governance, trust in public opinion, social trust, trust in cooperation and coordination, trust in economic behavior. And the second is transit. In order for China and India to grow to their fullest potential, both countries need to deepen their connectivity. Nepal's geographical location, abundant natural resources like water, biodiversity and landscape, widening and deepening connectivity across the border through transportation networks is taking shape with the initiative of implementing strategic networks within the country and with the agreements made with both China and India for the developments of energy the strategic networks, road links, railways, airways, and waterways, 
provide enough avenues for bilateral and tri trilateral cooperation and space for effective transit procedures. Nepal could play a constructive role as a dry port, economic zone, transit point in goods and services. This too adds to our first point, trust. Lastly, trade. Most nobody discussed, and as per the Department of Customs, Nepal has rupees 1.03 trillion deficit till mid-June 2018, the largest with India, with 684.85 billion rupees. And negative gap, trade gap, with also widening with countries such as Bangladesh, China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Indonesia. So picture economics progress through fair trade, free trade, trade barriers by the way of foreign markets, foreign know-how, foreign technology, and foreign investment. Two. So the second one is the political and economic institutions, intergovernmental and international organizations were formed after major wars, like the League of Nations, which did not succeed, United Nations, IMF, GATT, World Bank, brings everybody to the economic society. These institutions have helped in the last 250 years to bring the world together and ensure the relationship that have reached no danger. So it is important that India and Nepal and the region's relationship be strengthened through, next slide please, yeah, with the regional networking, bilateral, trilateral, and multilateral associations like SAC, BIMSTIC, SESEC, and BIBIN, which needs to galvanize keeping aside bilateral misunderstandings. Creating an environment of diplomatic isolations may revolve to strategic diplomatic error. Two, India's clear policy with the United States, China, and immediate neighbors. Three, establish defense diplomacy by initiating defense and military conferences, SARC Defense Ministry Conferences Conference, and SARC Chiefs Conference. Four, subdivide the imminent persons group to specialized groups like security groups, economic groups, and so on, to act and solve the trends of misappreciation, differences, and opinion of disagreements. So Thank you, sir. Uh, your time is running up. Are you concluding? Do you have uh, more? Yeah. So at the last, the leaders not only should focus on the changing policies, but also equally focus on the changing minds. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. You have come up with very, very concrete uh, suggestion, like forming EPG and all. Uh, They're very um, concrete suggestion. So now I would like to um, invite Dr. Nihar Naik to sit on the light, uh, sit light on this uh, theme, like what could be the measures to avoid security dilemma that we, India and Nepal, face? Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my sincere thanks to um, Sunil, um, chair, chairman of AIDIA and uh, NMML uh, India uh, for the invitation here and speaking such an important uh, topic. The time is short, but I'll just uh, briefly touch upon certain issues. Uh, when I got this topic from uh, organizer, then I started uh, thinking on this, how to go about it. So the first question came to my mind that uh, I must identify the individual countries' concerns, particularly in my topic in my, my presentation is confined to only India and Nepal. I'm not going to beyond that. I'm not touching South Asia in this presentation. Uh, then first thing came to what are the individual concerns, both Nepal and uh, India? Um, uh, you know, this morning Ramadhav made a very interesting observation and I'll start my presentation with that. Uh, he said that sovereignty brings responsibility. And this remarks appropriately applies in case of Nepal and India, and when they, both the countries have certain uh, security dilemma and uh, trust deficit, because both the countries are sovereign, but sometimes they forget to fulfill their responsibilities. Uh, when identify the individual concerns of uh, Nepal, I feel see uh, the sovereignty of issue has been, is a core to this security issue. I mean, it has been the entire, if there is some kind of you no know, negative feeling towards India, this kind of anti-India sentiment is there. The security issue has been embedded in that. I mean, it is somewhere related to that. And that is core of this uh, trust deficit. And territorial integrity, 
uh, as a small set syndrome, uh, it has like, uh, like fear of external aggression, becoming colony of either India or China because a landlord country, and uh, fear of loss of autonomy, uh, and interference from domestic and foreign affairs from neighboring countries. So these have been the core, uh, I mean, security concerns of Nepal even till today. If you'll see the articulation, foreign policy articulation of the present government also, they've been talking about a lot of revision in the India-Nepal uh, relations and uh, treaties. Uh, if you'll see how to tackle this kind of uh, security concerns, Nepal undertook certain measures. Number one, uh, it signed a 1950 Treaty of Peace and uh, Agreement with India uh, because of there at that time, uh, in the Himalayan region, China, and uh, they found China as a common enemy. So that treaty came out and because of the other internal factor also there. And the second is there's a, a peace and friendship treaty with China. Uh, later on, they entered into that. Then third, they become member of UN. Uh, and the fourth, they become the diversification foreign policy. If you'll see today, they have 161 diplomatic relations. Uh, fifth, they become member of NAM. And there was a time they were attempting to declare Nepal as a zone of uh, peace. So these are the certain measures they took basically to manage these kind of security concerns. And other security concerns of Nepal has been internal security challenges. And number one, the Maoist insurgency, which was a major issue till 2006. They have been overcome that issue. Uh, ethnic classes, which has been figured strongly in the 2014 uh, Nepal Army's uh, uh, internal security challenges. Religious radicalism and separatism, and particularly related to the Madhesh uprising. And the fourth, and the third, and the most important is the climate-related disasters. So it has been a major concern of Nepal. From the India's point of view, quickly, uh, the Himalayan as identified as a vital security barrier. There was a time both Nepal and India they identified the security um, barrier. Then boundary dispute within China and Pakistan, concern over external ideological influence during the Cold War period. Then internal security threats like separatist movement. Then uh, ethnic classes, then Maoist insurgency and Naxalism in Indian context, then trans terrorism and climate-related disasters. If you'll see, the, there are a lot of uh, issues, there are a lot of overlapping also between Nepal and India, but what are their common security concerns if you'll go to that? Obviously, Himalaya has been a vital security barrier between Nepal and India, both in a traditional sense and non-traditional uh, security uh, context. And then climate disasters is a major issue. Then money laundering, circulation fake currency issues, and gold smuggling and illegal trade. And left wing radicalism, it's India is an important issue, but Nepal to some extent is not more or there. But then question comes, uh, can they manage these issues individually? The next question comes. The answer is obviously no, because some issues are uh, basically require transboundary cooperation. And neither India, despite being a largest country with a lot of resources, with a, such a uh, big diplomatic relations, but still they can't manage it uh, single-handedly. It needs, obviously, it needs cooperation from uh, Nepal. Similarly, Nepal also equally depending on India to address all these uh, uh, security issues. Uh, we, you know, if you'll come out a little bit, uh, the security cooperation, we have very robust and comprehensive security cooperation, starting with a joint commission of foreign affairs ministers level, then home secretary level, then all the way come down till uh, there is a Nepal-India boundary uh, joint working group is there. And there are also cooperation at the bilateral and multilateral level, like suppose uh, SARC and BIMSTEC level. But despite all these arrangements and uh, these issues, there is a, I believe there is a, there is a trust deficit is there. Uh, because the trust deficit, if you quickly, I'll just give two examples for that. Uh, the 1919 plane hijack, there is a classic example of non-cooperation from Nepal side. Mao is taking shelter in Indian cities, again, the non-cooperation from the India side. Again, deployment of sky marshals and extra checking points at the Indian airport, again, this is a classic example of trust deficit. Then India's reluctance not to allow this Nepal, uh, Nepal using Siliguri corridor to trade with Nepal, Bangladesh is another uh, security dilemma. Then, obviously, this um, illegal and fake currency issues have been happening yeah. through the open uh, border. Dr. Dr. So Nihar, may I, may I put one question? Because you highlighted different security concerns like security concerns of Nepal and security concerns of India, that it has with Nepal. So my question is, for example, like there is aspiration of, of you know, Nepal to enhance connectivity with China, and also it is inviting BRI projects in Nepal. That obviously has uh, you know, caused some kind of concerns in India. Uh, that Nepal, of course, it is, there's, there's no bad intention involved. But now, since there is security concern already with India, how can we manage this security dilemma that India has? What do you think uh, can be done to you know, reconcile these two opposing interests? Because India is not, a part, not part of BRI. Obviously, it is against that idea. 
And whereas we want this, we want big infrastructure project and we want to enhance connectivity. And this, I think, you know, it, this has to do something with the recent, the, the, the incident that happened in recent past, the broker thing. So now what do you think should be these two countries doing in, in this case? Like how can we reconcile our uh, interest? You know, the BRI, uh, Nepal's position on BRI, is a, I, I believe this is a purely bilateral uh, relations with China. This is a bilateral issue. I don't think India has ever made any reaction or response on this issue officially. I mean, whatever you might have seen uh, India's uh, I mean, reactions, mostly in the media reactions, but formally, officially, government of India has not many, not many, any reactions on the BRI because the government of India has treated as a purely bilateral relations between India and uh, China. Uh, number two, as I said that in the remarks, and I still uh, uh, reiterate that Ramadha's position, is a responsibility, sovereignty and responsibility. And that is a core of our trust, uh, uh, I mean, relation, how relations go forward. And it is Nepal's responsibility to draw the red line. Because a sovereign country, it has a responsibility, it should have to the government of India certain concerns. Government of India has uh, repeatedly at the bilateral level and multilateral level has raised these concerns. So India, Nepal knows that. So how to deal with that BRI, it is, uh, is, the ball is in Nepal's court. Obviously, government of India is not going to any prescription or suggestion on this. Because we have a certain positions on the BRI. Because we have been part of AIB. But still, we have certain positions. We have articulated our positions BRI very clearly because of it's a related to our sovereignty issue. So we have certain positions, but we'll deal with it separately. But it's a completely issue between China and Nepal to deal with the BRI. So government of India, I don't think we will have any position on this. It's a very clear thing. Okay. Thank you very and, much. And one thing, this last couple of uh, suggestions, I'll just uh, read, read it out quickly. Uh, for this, I think this kind of this is a perfect issue to do a kind of you know, think tank level uh, bilateral uh, research on this. I need a constant dialogue and discussion at the political level and point five, uh, track 1.5 level. Needs to acknowledge either other other security concerns, take appropriate policy so it shouldn't affect other sentiment. And non-traditional security should be a conference in major major because there are a lot of commonalities between the non-traditional security issue and we can start the cooperation from that. Uh, so it would be a good beginning between the two countries in future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, you rightly mentioned about the remarks of uh, Ram Madhav this morning. And he also advised Nepal to uh, kind of look south. That was what he said. And he said, like, when you look south, you just do not see India. You also see Indian Ocean and beyond, like East Asia, Southeast Asia. So in that context, now I would like to invite uh, Geza Sarmawagli, security and strategic affairs expert, to, uh, you know, talk about how do we manage security dilemma. Thank you, Coach Raji. Honorable Chair, Dr. Rajan Watrai, my fellow distinguished panelists and distinguished participants. Talking about uh, managing security dilemma, the geopolitical reality within six minutes. I think it's impossible for me. We are, we are sorry for that because <laughs> we cannot give much right. Because these are so important, so ambiguous, so contested, and so relevant issues. It even might have been impossible like eloquent and articulate speaker like Barack Obama. So I can't do it all the things, but I will try my level best. If I can't do anything, at least I will conclude within six minutes. I will not put in odd position to you, Mr. Kosraji. I would like to start from two contexts. If we talking about uh, strategic and security relations between Nepal and India, there are two distinct features. First thing is we have open border with Nepal and India. It signifies our, as we use always, using many adjectives describing Nepal-India relations. I don't want to repeat that. Second thing, Chief of the Army, Staff of Nepal Army, is the Honorary General of the Indian Army. And Chief of the Army, Staff of the Indian Army, is the Honorary General of the Nepal Army. So we can imagine 
how intimate relations we have between Nepal and India. But having said that, let me draw your another attention. Having said that, we have good relations, intimate relations, but having said that, we had blockade. We had blockades in our history. That has undermined Nepal's security concerns. Not only security concerns, that has undermined our national interest, national security. Do my fellow Indian distinguished panelists and participants may have different opinion or second thoughts, but let's first admit that that is the reality. So we need to start our conversation, our debate, our research, and our understanding in these two distinct phases. So, uh, in my opinion, if we are talking about uh, security dilemma between Nepal and India and its geopolitical reality, I think the title is right because being a small, I mean the compared to India, and sandwich countries between India and China, Nepal has security concerns and sensitivity. India must respect Nepal's security concerns and sensitivity because it's, it has national dimensions, it has regional dimensions, and it has international dimensions. In my opinion, I would like to suggest both government of Nepal and government of India and think thanks. First, we need to redefine our relations, our political relations, our diplomatic relations, our strategic relations, our security relations, and our economic relations, and our cultural relations, and linguistic relations. Because, you may ask why, because the context is changed. The context is changing. My fellow uh, uh, panelists mentions about nepal india relations in the treaty of 1950, in geopolitical context, relations between Nepal and India. Yes, I do agree with him. And first, we need to redefine our entire gamut of the Nepal-India relations. And, and we need to start the redefining our Nepal-India relations by amending 1950s treaty. Because I would like to again reiterate the context is changed. So we need to redefine our relations based on changing context. Taking into consideration the national interest of Nepal and national interest of India, as well as India. Based on equal sovereignty, mutual benefit, and mutual interest. If we agree for that, there may not be many problems with regards to rev uh, revising, updating, and amending the 1950 treaty. That will contribute to enhance, to deepen, and widen Nepal-India relations with regards to political, with regards to diplomatic, with regards to strategic, with regards to security, with regards to economic, and with regards to trade and transit. If we agree upon that very reality, we can start the process. Fortunately, we have the chair who, who is the member of the eminent persons group, and uh, fortunately, they agree upon the both team, Nepal, Nepali team and Indian teams, agreed upon revising, updating, and amending the 1950s treaties according to the changing context and in line with the national interest of Nepal and national interest of India. If both government agree upon the, do it has not released it, do they haven't submitted to the both respective uh, countries, prime ministers, and it hasn't released yet. But uh, as we read in the newspaper, I think it is the encouraging development, and I would like to congratulate Dr. Bhattrai on behalf of our fellow uh, panelists and fellow participants, because the EPG did a commendable job. But uh, both governments 
should implement those uh, suggestions in line with the suggestions of the APG. And we think, think tank, I think one of the topics is the role of the uh, think tanks in with regards to relations with Nepal and India should uh, comprehensively uh, research on many issues like we have open border and its security implications both in uh, Nepal and India. And we have uh, many other issues like traditional security issues, non-traditional security issues. We have the issues of international terrorism, cross-border terrorism, I mean the uh, uh, human trafficking, uh, 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 drugs trafficking, like we have many uh, cross-border uh, issues because of the open border. And we have other uh, non-traditional issues like uh, climate change and global warming and migration in both Nepal and India have the serious uh, uh, threat of non-traditional security as well. So uh, the government of Nepal and government of India should comprehensively analyze the entire security threat, both traditional security threat and non-traditional threat. And we should uh, plan some of the issues uh, uh, can do on behalf of the government and some on behalf of the Indian government. And some issues we need to address both, I mean, the, both, go both governments. Basically, with, with regards to non-traditional security threats like climate change and global warming. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I think our time, time is, is almost out. out. Um, and I, would I, like, I want to ask one question in this context. Uh, I, like uh, I would like to conclude my comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. One question, sir. Like you mentioned about all these security challenges and security dilemma that both the countries have. What do you think uh, would be the role of think tanks of both the countries in this context? As I mentioned earlier, with regards to uh, relations between Nepal and India, uh, with regards to security issues, we have many issues. We are talking about open border and its implications. But we don't know the, uh, whether it is opportunity or threats or challenge. If it is opportunity, we don't know what kind of opportunity we have. If it is threat, we don't have what kind of threats we are facing. So think tanks can research on it and can bring the findings of the research and organize this kind of forums and uh, conclave summits of seminars and workshops. And we can submit those, those findings to the respective countries, both Nepal and India. So if the, if the governments took into consideration those kind of findings, I think uh, the, it will uh, have the positive contribu uh, contribution uh, to addressing those kind of issues. Thank you. Thank you very Nepal much, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, you're right. Nepal has transformed itself into a strategic epicenter from uh, the traditional backwater in recent years. It's because of changing uh, paradigm in the global the geopolitics in this region. So again, continuing with, the, with our discussion, now I would like to invite Dr. Constantino Javier. He's a fellow at foreign policy, uh, he's a fellow foreign policy at Brookings India. And we talked a lot about Brookings India even in our previous session, like it had come up with a very interesting findings. Uh, some, some speakers, they mentioned about his name. So uh, Dr. Constantino, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, AIDI and the Nehru Memorial, Memorial Museum and Library for hosting us here, to the Embassy of India, who's welcomed us here for this uh, conference in Kathmandu. Um, Brookings India is an Indian think tank, part of the larger Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C., but has several centers around the world to promote think tank research, uh, which uh, is focused on independence, quality, and impact. Myself, I worked on the Indian neighborhood policy. Uh, I've done archival research. I've done, I've done interviews. I like to say that it's in Kathmandu that you actually get to know India's foreign policy the best. Uh, if you want to understand Indian foreign policy, don't go to Delhi. You come to Kathmandu, and here you realize what the Indian thinking is, what Indian strategic thinking is, what India's difficulties are also in policy making. So I've benefited tremendously of coming on to Kathmandu over 12 years now, uh, speaking to people here and seeing India from Nepal. So I'm sure I'm speaking also here to many experts of Indian foreign policy. But let me share with you what I uh, think about this problem, which I think is very aptly titled, The Dilemma 
in security relations um, uh, and managing the dilemma, the security dilemma in Nepal. There's only a security dilemma when there's absolute sovereignty between two states. There's only a security dilemma when you have independent foreign policies which clash or sometimes come into tension. And you can only manage, and that's why I like this word which was chosen, managing the security dilemma. It's not uh, exploring it, uh, 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 using it, uh, minimizing it, it's managing it. When you have two responsible powers coming together and sharing their perspectives and how to manage their relationship. And I think that's really the moment we are now in India-Nepal relations. For the first time in the history of India-Nepal relations since 1947, you have, I think, a mutual respect on both sides. And I think due credit goes to these current prime ministers on both sides, Prime Minister Oli on the side of Nepal and Prime Minister Modi on the side of India, who've engaged in, I think, a very mature, responsible way to look at common problems uh, and not you know, provoke each other or use each other for other um, purposes. And I think on the side of, of Nepal, you've seen uh, this in Prime Minister Oli engaging India directly. Uh, he's visited India in a very important bilateral visit. Uh, he's uh, shied away from uh, you know, looking at the past and the tensions of the past. He's lo his, look, I think is, his outlook is towards the future and engaging India proactively. On the side of India, I think it's symbolic that since uh, for seven, when Prime Minister Modi came here in late 2014, it was the first visit of an Indian Prime Minister in 17 years. Uh, he's come two more times since then. He's coming a fourth time this uh, uh, um, next month. So that really shows, I think, engagement from the Indian side too. But there's another word in this panel, which is reality. So I will be very real and frank in what I think are the main challenges, uh, the real challenges beyond the beautiful speeches on both sides. And I think there's four challenges for India. There's four challenges for Nepal. For Nepal, for, let me start with India. I think the first problem for India here has been one to transiting from what used to be, I think many here in Nepal are familiar with that, the policy of right of first refusal, of India having a special prerogative, a special right in Nepal, and changing that policy to one of capacity of first delivery, of being in Nepal first and delivering what Nepal needs and requires and wants. And that's a shift which is ongoing and that will be and continue to be a challenge because it it, it changes the emphasis from denial, saying, Nepal, you can have this, you cannot have that, we will help you, we will decide for you, to one of, you decide what you want and we will come in and provide it better, quicker, and faster than any other country. So it puts the ball in Delhi's court. Uh, I think as, and I think you've seen a transition in that. You've had Prime Minister Modi speaking about the revival of the Gujral Doctrine, of an asymmetric policy of India giving more benefits to Nepal and taking in many ways sometimes a policy which costs it domestically but for the benefit of Nepal and the bilateral relationship. Uh, you've had also the importance of multilateral connectivity in Look South, the importance of roping in Nepal into the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean region, we heard this this morning, and what I think my uh, the fellow pr previous panelist spoke, um, Sujiv Sakya, called South East South Asia, connectivity between Nepal, the northeast of India, Bangladesh, uh, and the Bay of Bengal. The second challenge is one, I think, an Indian mindset to moving away from a legalistic approach. We spoke about the 1950 treaty just here. I think it's very important for India to act as a great power, which is not concerned about little words and little rules and little laws, and really faces Nepal as a sovereign equal nation, which is different from 1950. Uh, there is something called sovereignty, but I like to say, and as a student of international relations, there's degrees of sovereignty. And Nepal has been, is today as sovereign as it has never been before. And that's very important that needs to be recognized in Delhi. Therefore, treaties are important, rules are important, and this treaty should be revised and dramatically revised, I think. And India should, I think, be quite generous in giving any type of concession Nepal wants. Because in the end, and this is the, the other side of it, treaties don't really matter. It matters what India is able to deliver in terms of economic connectivity, capacity, development assistance, security assistance, in being operational on the ground in Nepal. The third challenge for India is one of, I think, spelling out what is often called strategic concern. You will hear many times Indian officials saying, you can do whatever you want in Nepal, but there are certain strategic concerns you have to keep in mind. Now, obviously India has security concerns as a great power across an open border with Nepal, but it has to spell out in proper private channels very clearly what these concerns are. It's not fair game to say whenever Nepal does anything at all with China, with any other country, say, oh, wait, 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 this impinges on our strategic and security concerns. What? Does a Chinese electricity project in the Terai really impinge on Indian security concerns? This is a rhetorical question, but this needs to be discussed very openly, very frankly, because I can tell you from the history of Indian-Nepal relations, 
Crises have always happened when India has not communicated clearly with Nepal and vice versa. Finally, last challenge is on the diversity of constituencies. I think this conference is a very good example of, I think, reaching out to new constituencies, uh, new people in Nepal. Nepal today is one of the youngest countries in Asia. It's one which you have, which you have new mediums where people are expressing themselves freely like never before in the media, on Twitter. So it's very important for India, the challenge of reaching out to new sectors in the Nepalese society. And not only traditional groups, it has, of course, banked on for many decades. It's very important to reach out to new groups and revise, I think, many misconceptions which exist also about India in Nepal. Four challenges for Nepal. So for Converse, I think challenges which Nepal will have to deal with. I think the first one is, uh, you'll know the old saying that with great power comes great responsibility. Nepal today has more power. Nepal today has more autonomy. With that comes also more responsibility in engaging India and engaging other countries. Instead of just thinking of itself as a small country, helpless country, uh, always being bullied by India. I mean, all those narratives we know so well. Today, Nepal has a stable democratic government. Today, Nepal has alternatives beyond India. It has China, it has Japan, it has Europe, it has the US. And it's very important that Nepal takes a very much more mature approach to saying, you know, we can take our own destiny in our own, ha in our own hands. So it's important, for example, to come to Delhi. You will think that Delhi knows much about Nepal. You'll be surprised how few experts there are on Nepal and Delhi. How many people follow Nepal, Nepalese politics on a day-to-day -day basis? How many people look at connectivity projects in India and Nepal? It's very important for Nepal now to come to Delhi and say what it wants, engage new people in Delhi, uh, promote its point of view in, in, in Delhi, and therefore invest in public diplomacy, have a more active embassy in Delhi. All things which have not always happened in the past, I think that's very important, therefore also to engage think tanks in Delhi. The second cha cha challenge is what I call the China illusion. Uh, I spoke about the importance of India also not overreacting to China, but at the same time, Nepal also needs to realize that you know, the grass looks very green now across the Himalayas in China, but if you look at how China has operated in other countries across South Asia, there are tremendous concerns and dangers in, I think, in engaging China too. I think the debate in Nepal has to happen also, how close do you want to become to China? On what terms? Uh, everything looks very nice and good now. Of course, China is saying that, you know, it will not get involved. Uh, in, 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 uh, in, in Nepal, but if you look at the headlines today in the newspaper this morning was saying about Chinese NGOs operating now at a large extent across Nepal. There will be naturally, there's nothing wrong with that, but China, as China will invest more in Nepal, it will have more political stakes and interest in Nepal and will start to do what India has done sometimes in the past, which is trying to also shape the politics of Nepal and support Nepal in its own interest. So you will have that sooner or later beyond any type of financial crisis and problems which will come. I don't need to look any further than Sri Lanka, where you've seen now over the last 10 years a tremendous debt trap from the Chinese, which has allowed them to make money and gain strategic and economic leverage over Sri Lanka. The third challenge, I think, for Nepal is not to overestimate the importance of balancing. You know, there's a long literature on non-alignment in India, but I like to look at the best policy of non-alignment, the one being in Nepal. If you look, look from the 1950s, Nepal has always followed non-alignment, tried at least non-alignment between China and India. It's not always been able to do that, but it has a very strong and rich and very interesting tradition of playing the balancing game. But there's dangers of playing the balancing game. You can balance, the, you can balance India, you can play with different partners, but you have to be very careful not to be caught in the dependency of China. You also have to be important, you have to also be concerned not to, of course, depend only and as you have in the past on India for your trade routes. But it's important also because I think there's a temptation to look at China now. Um, there's a danger of either what you would call a G1 in Nepal, India controlling Nepal. There's also another danger of course, having a G2 in Nepal, which is India and China controlling and sharing and making uh, Nepal into a buffer zone and separating it into its own zones of influence. Therefore, it's actually in the interest of Nepal, and that's going to be a challenge, to reach out to other states, okay. other thank, countries and other you. states that can diversify uh, your strategic relations. That's where multilateral agencies come in. That's where Japan comes in. That's where many other European uh, and the US uh, states come into. So finally, let me just finish with this okay. last point, uh, deepening democracy. Uh, Nepal never had so much democracy as today. I think it's something which needs to be cherished. Uh, Mr. Ram Mandavji said that today we have a mature, stable, democratic Nepal, which India is very proud of and which India supported. But at the same time, that is not the end of the game. You need to deepen democracy, and that means bringing in new constituencies and in understanding that democracy is not just a luxury or a question of principle. Uh, democracies have a purpose in terms of ensuring sustainable growth, 
uh, peace, stability, especially in very diverse societies like Nepal. And therefore, let me, if I may, finish with a quote from Jawaharlal Nehru in 1951. Uh, he's speaking internally among his officials in the Ministry of External Affairs. He sent a secret uh, memo to his Secretary General of the Ministry of External Affairs, he's speaking about Nepal, and he says, let me quote, there is far too much of a tendency to think in terms of Kathmandu and rather, rather to ignore the hill people and more especially the Terai. And that this is very unwise, both in Delhi and in Kathmandu, because it's bound to trouble in the future. So it's very important to keep the importance of diversity uh, uh, on the table in Nepal and deepen democratic institutions and keeping them alive for, for Nepal to prosper, I think, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving all this constructive suggestion to you know, manage security dilemma that we both the countries have. Thank you very much. Uh, now I invite uh, Brigadier General Kesar Badu Bhandari, he's also Secretary General of Nepal Institute for Strategic Studies, to speak on the theme. Thank you very much. Thank you, organizer, uh, respected chair, uh, panelist, and distinguished guest. Uh, I'll be focusing mainly on the theme that has been provided with, and I'll be dealing mostly with the security concern related to Nepal and vis-a-vis -vis India. We did talk enough about Nepal and India share so many things in common. We get the best of the relations, open border, all the good things. In these backdrops, then relations between India and Nepal should have been at the highest and the best. Paradoxically, it is not so. Why? This is something we need to question. Why having or being so many things in common, still we are not getting along that well. So this is where the dilemma lies. And security is one area that concerns most. So this is where the security dilemma lies. Actually, Nepal and India doesn't have any historical negativity. So even without having all the things, but their negativity has been created by we people. So this needs to be addressed, this needs to be reckoned with, and we need to move ahead. So on this remark, I'll be dealing the relations or security dilemma or security concern in certain issues. And I'll go by issue-wise. First of all, issue of security dilemma, the first dilemma I will say, that's the irritants exist between Nepal and India. Nepal has got a lot of irritants, minor and major irritants. I would like to list all. So does India have irritants? India, big country, for them that irritants, those irritants doesn't matter much or doesn't affect much to India. But even the minor irritants does affect Nepal and touches the Nepalese sentiment. That's why at times, anti-Indian sentiment has been raised even in a small issues. But why it is happening? So, this happening because many things did take place in the past and it's taking place every day. Talk about the border, the problems that we've been facing the border, there are so many things we can list it out, which I will be doing today at this, today in this forum. Because of certain small acts, activity that does take place, it has kind of alienated Nepalese psyche. Choudhury mentioned a small incident that he witnessed, I think, yesterday. So these are the simple, these have been beacons of those kind of irritants. Now, second point I'll be dealing with, with the treaties and the letter of exchanges that Nepal and India has signed in the past. Major security concern and the contentious issue has remained 
about security because of this letter of exchanges and the 1950 treaties. I hope the eminent group, eminent EPG, eminent people's group must have addressed all these, I would say, differences. I hope the report will come good and will be addressed for the better relations between India and Nepal. Now, another very contentious issue is the issue of Tarai. Tarai is a very much core and part of Nepal, and we share the sentiment with the people of Tarai. Whole Nepal share the sentiment with the people of Tarai. They have got a grievances, they have got a demand. Yes, any genuine demand and grievances must be addressed in the bigger perspective of the Nepalese need. But on that note, there are some secessionist movement has come about. That is something Nepal will never tolerate and Nepal should not tolerate. Because a person like Mr. C.K. Raut, his organization has even registered his organizations to un unrepresented nations and people's organization, UNPO, which advocates, which trains those kind of people to go for the independent or the secessionist movement. And this, at no cost, Nepal should have any dilemma. They should be dealt squarely and whatever it may take, regardless of the fact, Nepal's territorial integrity has to remain intact no matter what. Any turmoil or any disturbances or the unstable tarai, India cannot or will not remain unaffected. And this kind of secessionist movement by themselves cannot survive either. They must be having some covert or overt support wherever it may be from. So this is something to be taken note by both India and Nepal. India's major internal security problem today is the Maoist in Jharkhand and most of the part of those area. Nepal is having a government, communist government. So, well, someone or anyone can raise a question, do they have some connections or will they get some sympathy from Nepal? as Nepalese people did get sympathy from them in the past. I mean, these are the few things that security concern that we need to be looking at. And now talking about the connectivity, I'll talk about the railway connectivity. Railway connectivity just doesn't bring trade and prosperity only. India came with the reactive proposal. Soon China said they will bring train from uh, Kerong to Kathmandu. So India came with a proposal as a reaction from Rakshul to Kathmandu. Well, as long as for the good gestures, good enough. Why India didn't do in the past? Why it has to come as a reaction? But such kind of connectivity doesn't bring only prosperity and the trade. It may also bring some security concern like military harvest and all. And Nepal in no way want to be the stage for the conflict between these two big neighbors. And we'll try to be facilitator in this regard. And last, I want to emphasize on a point, how to resolve or solve these things. So this is something that we need to talk about the attitude change. In 2014, there was a forum where about the border between India and Nepal, there's interactions forum. One of the participants raised the issue, unless India changes its big brotherly attitude to the elder brotherly attitude, no irritants or not many problems are going to be resolved. And this needs to be done. And Ranjit Ray, the ambassador of India, then was the chief guest. After a month or so, Sushma Sura, the foreign minister, she came to Nepal in the Samsar conference. And while going back to Delhi, in Kathmandu airport, she said, simply, Nepal, India will always treat and behave Nepal as an elder brother and not a big brother. This is what she said in the airport in Nepal. And same thing she reiterated, she reiterated in the upper house when there is an issue of the blockade. So this is something, it has been taken note of, but this has not been internalized and this has not been materialized as yet. So sooner they, this thing is realized and materialized, better for both of the country. Sir, sir can you yes. say light a little bit on how do we manage this concern? I will just conclude and I'll answer okay. your questions. Okay, said and done. So now we, 
when this Modi government came, so he came out with the neighborhood fast policy. Wonderful thing. But this has become more of a rhetoric than the actually delivery things like. What we got after that is a sponsor blockade. That too at the time when we needed help most after the earthquake. So these are the few things. These are not the irritants. These are the major irritants, I would say so. So these things need to be corrected. So we have to correct. And Nepal and India are such a, I would say, symbiotic relations we have. We just can't afford to continue and carry on this garbage in our bag. So both parties should realize, and we should address it squarely, get resolved, and we should be living at the best of the brother. And Nep India don't have any other country than Nepal with whom they share everything in common. Thank you so very much. Yes. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. I think you addressed my question as well, right? Wonderful. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. Uh, you highlighted the different issues that we have with India. And uh, Indian friends also, they have shared uh, the concerns India has towards Nepal. So now, I think, uh, last but not the least, we have another speaker from India. Um, Samir Patil is a fellow at National Security Studies and also Director, um, Center for International Security, Gateway House. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Sunil Ji, AIDA, and MML for giving me this opportunity to come to Kathmandu for the first time and participate in this important gathering. Uh, I work for Gateway House, which is a foreign policy think tank in Bombay. We are not for profit, non-partisan, independent, and we don't take government funding and foreign funding. Uh, we started in 2009, so we are a relatively young think tank uh, within the think tank circuit in India. Talking of uh, India-Nepal relations, I think uh, the most succinct way that has been put is by Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi, who said that Nepal-India relations are as old as Himalayas and the Ganga. And yes, there are concerns on the growing Chinese influence in the country, but despite all these twists and turns, the general perception within India is that that Nepal has appreciated India's security concerns and has protected India's security concerns. Um, there are a lot of synergies between the bilateral relationship, uh, and I'm going to focus on four such uh, synergies. The first is counterterrorism. Now, uh, counterterrorism cooperation between India and Nepal was there for, uh, for many uh, years, but it really flourished after the 2008 uh, Mumbai attacks, uh, when terrorist groups wanted to use the Nepalese territory for anti-India activities. Joint operations between Nepalese and the Indian security forces have resulted in arrest of important lashkar e taiba and Indian Mujahideen operatives. In fact, after India-Bangladesh counterterrorism co cooperation, it is the cooperation between India and Nepal which has significantly contributed to decreasing India, uh, the, the threat of terrorism to the Indian hinterland. Having said that, a lot needs to be done to uh, tackle other uh, aspects of terrorism, money laundering, terrorist financing, and misuse of cyberspace by the extremist uh, elements. And certainly, given the history of cooperation, law enforcement agencies can work together, for instance, in tracking suspicious financial transactions and helping to put in place standards as laid down by the international financial institutions to bridge the gaps for money laundering. Second, our defense diplomacy is working smoothly through the Surya Kiran uh, series of joint exercises. Uh, the latest one just happened two weeks back in Uttarakhand. Uh, India has been providing military training facilities to the Nepalese army, which has helped to a large extent forge personal ties between the officers of the Indian army and the Nepalese uh, army. And this aspect needs, needs to be highlighted to overcome the trust dilemma between the two countries. And I think the intimate relationship between the militaries of the two countries remains underappreciated in India, which goes back to the point which was made previously about uh, the lack of enough understanding of Nepal within uh, India. The third point is cybersecurity. In 2014, Prime Minister Modi had said that India wants to help Nepal in three ways, through HIT, highways, information technology, and transmission lines. Use of information technology within Nepal is increasing as the technology is being used for improving the delivery of many citizen-centric services. But the digital technology is also being misused as evident in the growth of cyber frauds, cyber crimes, and data and privacy breaches. India, too, is facing the similar cybersecurity challenges. So there is a great deal that can be done by both the countries in this space to strengthen the domestic police forces' capability to handle cyber crimes, 
focus on critical infrastructure protection, and also look at the emerging threat of online black markets where arms and drug smuggling are happening. It is pertinent to note that in the last four years, India has strengthened its focus on cybersecurity, both domestically by new arrangements and new initiatives, and diplomatically through partnerships with other countries. So cybersecurity is a promising area for both the countries to forge collaboration. And finally, the regional collaboration. There's a lot that can be done at the regional level. We have already successfully launched the Bangladesh-India-Nepal Motor Connectivity Agreement. Given the similar nature of security challenges for the three countries, maybe security cooperation at the BIN level can also be explored. Similarly, of late, there has been a greater interest in the BIMSTEC, the Bay of Bengal Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic uh, Cooperation. And some of these concerns, such as smuggling and cybersecurity, can definitely be discussed at the BIMSTEC level to explore the common uh, grounds of cooperation. Ultimately, we are neighbors sharing open borders, and that fact is not going to change for the foreseeable future. So the only way to manage our security dilemma is to strengthen the existing cooperation mechanisms and explore new areas where we can cooperate because, unfortunately, for India and Nepal, the regional security environment remains in a flux. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just I want to add, uh, put one question. Um, like, what happens is, like, uh, when we talk about India-Nepal relations, China automatically comes in. Right? That, that, is, that has become a reality, that's a fact. Now, there was a concern like when China starts investing in mega project in Nepal, there's uh, you know, a big security concern in India. The fact is that like we Nepalese, we want investment coming from both the countries, be it from China, be it from India, we want investment. But now, since there are like huge security concerns that are expressed by policymakers, media, and others, if you look at the Indian media, for example, there was a big issue about Budi Gandaki hydropower project, and also there's an issue about uh, West Sethi and all. So now, how do we manage this kind of security uh, dilemma? Do you have any specific recommendation? Like, thank you. I think uh, when it comes to the Chinese investments in India's neighborhood, I think India is not opposed to the principle of connectivity, uh, I mean, at least the connectivity in principle. Uh, what India has raised concerns are on the issues of sovereignty, which is most evident in the case of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. But with regard to the nature of the Chinese investments, I think it is best for the host country to ex examine on what terms and conditions the investment is coming, because a lot of this investment is happening on not so transparent conditions. And if you look at the example of Sri Lanka, which has been cited as you know repeatedly as what has happened to Sri Lanka uh, after so so many uh, after after accepting so much investment, and Maldives, where China has been able to tilt the political equations in that uh, island nation, I think it is for the host country to examine you know on what conditions it is that the Chinese the Chinese investments are coming. And I think one way that India can help some of the other I mean the countries in the neighborhood is to make them understand the implications of the Chinese investment and make them understand as to what is happening with other countries, and so that they can be a better judge of the, the way they, they accept the investments from China. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, so I think it would be great injustice uh, if we do not entertain few questions from audience, because we could not do that in our previous two sessions because we were late, because uh, the, our chief guests arrived a little late. So now I want to entertain few questions from the floor. I may not be able to take many, yeah please. Volunteers, please, can you just uh, hand over the mics? But try to be brief, and please introduce yourself, sir. Uh, thank you. Brief. First of all, this is Dwarika Dungel, a social science researcher. Uh, I would like to congratulate all the pa panel members. D listening to our Indian scholars, and uh, I was not present in the morning, but if I have understood what you said, that sovereignty has the responsibility and look south. And China factor has come again and again. We have been warned that be aware of China. My question to our Indian friends, is it that Nepal has to sign another security pact because 1950 has not been sufficient to, fear, to avoid another blockage? This Thank is you, one. Thank Okay. And the other one is, can India forget China in terms of trade relation between themselves and can advise us not to be, and advise us to be careful of China in terms of Chinese investment in Nepal? Thank you. So gentlemen here, please. 
So I'll take all the questions, like few questions, four, five questions, and then please. Okay, try to be brief, sir. Uh, so please uh, translate in English. In 2040, in democracy, either it is only in the Himalaya area or the Pahari area, so called, or the democracy is also for the Madeshi or Tarayan people. So, it is so called blockade. It was uh, so-called blockade because the uh, peoples of Tarai was in Bilkul Andolan Me Mathiyo, but the Andolan Me Bhaya ko, ro Tarai ko, democracy ko lagi, Taraiyan people ko rights ko lagi, yadi India le blockade gare ko ho bhani pani, to thik ho ki hoi na. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So his question was, I think uh, yes. our, our uh, Indian friends, they, did you get the question? All right, what we were saying is in 1990, there was blockade imposed by India. Question. Uh, that was for, yes, sir. Just, just to translate this question. And there was blockade in 1990 that was to support for the cause of democracy. And similar blockade we face. But he was, his question is, was it good for India to impose blockade even if it was for the cause of democracy? That was 1990. And so we have another gentleman there. Uh, Corner, sir, yeah, please. I've got this mic. Thank you. Uh, uh, I don't know the chair, Mr. Dr. Bhattarai, who will answer, but I would like to uh, answer from him, as well as Nihari, you also. Uh, as per the media in Kathmandu, we have heard that the, the EPG proposed to regulate it border with the ID card. Uh, then this morning, when I was listening to all the speakers, I find that everybody was speaking on the tradition, culture, history, Ramayan, Mahabharat, many things. So our relations are based and defined on the basis of all these things. But when you see, say that it should be an identity card, then it's the new things. The question arises, the people of Tarai and the people of the Eastern Hill and Western Hill, who has a close linkage with India and close linkage with Nepal, from both sides. So what kind of relation you wanted to define, redefine between these existing relations? And it might be create irritants in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and West Bengal, as well as in Nepal, Tarai, and the Eastern and Western Himal. So this is my first question. Second thing uh, to General Bandari, I have uh, raised the question of blockade and question of Tarai, the problem grievances. This is not the grievances. This is a question of liberating people from internal colony. And Madesi has been since 250 years, has been treated as a slave, Tharus and all these Dalits and everybody. And that's why the moment in Tarai, it's not the simple grievances. It's a fight for equality, fight for justice, so when you are talking about the 2015 and the Indianapolis Constitution, which is, the, I feel, as a discriminatory and not properly democ democratic constitution. So that was the people, like me, I was in the border. I spent three, four days in the border at the Birgand Raksol. So can you be so brief, I feel please? It. So this is my question is that the people of both the areas, when whether in the morning the minister of the industry commerce said that, he went to India for fighting most movement. In the same with the BP Kerala to till debt, all the leaders going, and same with the Indian leaders come when there is a crisis in India in 1947 and even 1975. So I might just comments over that. This is the reality of our border. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Dipendra, sir, please. My name is Dipendra Bahadur Chetri. I used to be the former vice chair of National Planning Commission. My uh, concern is that since India and Nepal has very good relation between two countries, but internally, if we, if we examine, militarily, we have been a kind of uh, submerged with India. Let me tell, give you the example. We have just 28 million population and three or four um, pension-paying camps, additional 14, 16, 
camps are being asked by Indian government. When we ask to close down the uh, military, not the irrigation, Lahajo office in Biratnagar, it was very difficult for the Indian government to close down that office also. If we continue to go with the uh, demand of the Indian government, allowing them to establish the pension paying camps for those 28 million population, that is not all the uh, population is from Indian army, just 60,000 or so, uh, will it be possible to preserve our uh, sovereignty or thank we you. are going to be Mauritius or Papua New Guinea. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. You. Thank you, sir. So one final question, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. I, I just want you to be very brief, please. We are running short of time already okay. and we have another okay. session as well. So my, name is, my name is Sisir Yadav and I'm advocate at, for profession. So my question is specifically to our uh, Brigadier General. So the thing is that, do you have any hard evidence that India supports secessionist movement in Tarai? Thank you very much. And if yes, please highlight. If not, uh, we will talk on that later Thank on. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mr. very Russell, last one, question. Was one question. Okay. My question is this. What was the philosophy between India and Nepal to keep the border open? Okay. Kis philosophy ke antargat? कुन दर्शन को अंतर्गत नेपाल भारत को सीमा ओपन रखे हुए थे और आइले कुन दर्शन अंतर्गत इट वाज द पॉलिटिकल इट वाज द कल्चरल इट वाज द इकोनॉमिक्स आइले कुन दर्शन अंतर्गत व्हाट आर द थ्रेड्स नाउ गोइंग टू रेगुलेट द दिस बॉर्डर्स विथ आईडेंटिटी कार्ड सो आई वांट टू नो दिस ओके थैंक य Many questions have come from Indian parties, uh, you know, uh, speakers. Maybe you can. Uh, yeah, just uh, on the educating the neighbors. I think that refers, I think Samir mentioned it, a question came up on how India needs to educate its neighbors about the dangers of China. I think uh, external affairs minister Sushma Suraj was misquoted on that. I don't think the word was educate. I think the larger point was there needs to be a larger debate in South Asia about the long-term implications of Chinese investments. And this is a mature debate between different countries who can share experiences, share experiences with the Chinese or with other countries about the terms of investment, the terms of loans, uh, etc. You see, for example, in China, uh, the President Xi Jinping visited a year and a half ago. Uh, uh, he visited Bangladesh, sorry. Uh, and he announced a package of uh, $24 billion uh, in terms of economic assistance uh, and saying these were grants mostly. And of course, six months later, the Chinese embassy started saying, oh, well, it's not, they're not all grants, some of them are loans and at very high interest rates. So this is a debate which needs to happen. So it's not only about territorial sovereignty, I think which Shamir was mentioned, it's about the large implications which come with any type of external involvement. And I think Nepal is very familiar with the dangers which come with external involvement. There is a price. So I think the importance is not to buy into this no strings attached, it's all fine, it's win-win approach. It's never win-win in international relations. And I think uh, the sooner I think people in Nepal realize it, the better. But I think in terms of the bilateral relationship, there is a lot which India has been doing. Uh, I mentioned the prime ministerial visits for the Joint Commission, uh, which is supposed to meet every two or three years, had not met more than once or twice since 1989 or 1990. It's met, I think, two or three times already. Uh, you have this joint uh, monitoring mechanism now with the Indian ambassador meeting your foreign secretary regularly, has met five times already. So there's really a lot of happening in terms of implementation on the ground, which needs to be recognized, I think, as a result of India's neighborhood first policy. And then finally, I think it's very easy to also say India, China. You said China comes in all the time. India, China, India, China. And I was making the point about other countries because it's very important for Nepal to have a variety of partners. You have to spread your eggs into different baskets. That's what small countries do when they play intelligent strategic games. They spread their risk, they have a variety of partners so you don't depend on one country or you don't, you're not suddenly hostage to an India-China condominium in Nepal, which is a reality. So I think it's, of course, tempting now to throw out multilateral organizations, throw out the United Nations, throw out the NGOs, throw out the Western agencies, or throw out the Europeans who are annoying with human rights. Of course, they've been annoying. I think there needs to be a lot of also 
monitoring mechanisms in how development assistance is given out in Nepal. Uh, many of these countries from the West have come here and done whatever they wanted. Many multilateral organizations have done whatever they wanted, but it's also important to keep them in the game and keep, and also other Asian countries which are very interested in coming in Nepal. The Koreans are very interested in supporting uh, Nepal, for example. ASEAN is a very interesting partner, I think, through the Bay of Bengal for Nepal. And finally, the last point to the question about the blockade. Very interesting question. You know, on 1990 in particular, which was your question, uh, the John Adelan won and the victory in April 1990, for example. I'm, I'm you're probably referring to the most recent blockade, but let me go back to 8790. You don't need to go further than ask your own leaders who openly said, including G.P. Corella, uh, K.P. Batra, and, and Manmohan Adhikari, who all said that democracy in Nepal in 1990 would not have happened without Indian support between 87 and 90, right? So that was naturally, it was not India which created that crisis. Uh, it was the king himself who brought that crisis to himself. And it ended in the first victory for democratic forces since 1960 in Nepal. And then on the Indian side, so I think Nepalese leaders themselves recognized that democracy at that point was supported by India. But at the same time, you have the visit of external affairs minister Narasimha Rao in August 1990. He came. And he said, very well, very good, we're happy with Nepal being more democratic now, but this is not the end of the game. It's a long road to democracy. And he quoted from uh, Goswami Tulsidas, 16th century Avadi uh, epic, uh, and actually in Avadi language, he was speaking at the Nepal Institute for International Affairs in August 1990. And let me quote him, he said that, a king whose subjects are in pain deserves hell. And he's warning that, you know, a leader, it could be the king of Nepal, it could be today's prime minister, it could be any leader, if the leadership and the government does not recognize the importance of democracy and bringing people in, free elections, and having a free and fair society, you know, that doesn't, they will face a crisis. You need to keep democracy going, you need to keep bringing in new constituencies into, the, into uh, Nepal's democracy. Hello. Yeah, there are two uh, questions uh, asked by Mr. Dungelji, uh, and that was based on um, this morning's uh, statement of uh, Ram Madhavji. And had he been here, he could have been uh, responded to your question very effectively. Um, but being a researcher, I would just say one thing. Uh, he didn't say anything that there should be another treaty between India and Nepal to look, uh, I mean, uh, when, he, when he suggested to look towards South. Basically, being a general secretary of political party and that party ruling uh, in India at this moment, he might have, what he might have said, that look, there are so many opportunities. There is already so many arrangements are there. And this is a business opportunity for uh, Nepal to improve its uh, transit relations and bilateral relations with India and trade, particularly trade issues. There is a BBIN, there is a forum. There is a BIMSTEC, there is a SARC. And you see, there is a 22, uh, you know, transit uh, I mean, gates are there between Nepal and India, which is not with uh, China and India. And second is there is a trade and transit treaty. So if it's the so many, everything is there, is perfect platform to improve your relationship, bilateral trade relationship with India. So that way he suggested. That doesn't mean that he indicated that you go for another uh, treaty. So I don't think there is wrong, there is no wrong in, I mean, uh, as, a, as a Indian political leader, he suggested there's no wrong in that. Uh, second is the blockade thing. See, any kind of blockade, I'm against any kind of blockade. Being a researcher, I don't think that. But if you'll see the blockade in when that happened in 2015, that is not an official statement of India. India never said this is a blockade from asset. What I felt that the business was happening, the, 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 the normal pace was affected because of the truckers' movement from this side to that side. And there was also extra security, security measures were taken by government of India agency side because they're anticipating some amount of anti, uh, I mean, like CK, Rahul, Thunder, they will go for kind of underground, they may go for the armed revolution. So they thought that there could not be any illegal uh, no, 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 supply of arms from Indian territory. So unnecessary, to, unnecessary government of India will be blamed. So that kind of security measures they took. Otherwise, the movement was going like, for, except Bhairwa and uh, Birat Nagar, Kakadvita was up, opened, uh, Nepal Ganj were opened, other trading points were opening. So the, the, it is slow, it affected the trade was slow. Second, in the consulate uh, office, I can say that, uh, look, when the sovereignty issue, the, which the th three things are not happening broadly in the international relations, I don't know how Nepalese uh, scholars are interpreting that. If any kind of uh, foreign, uh, I mean, presence is not affecting your foreign policy, 
your defense policy, and economic policy, your sovereignty is not challenged. And none of these three issues were affected because of consulate office in uh, Birat Nagar. And second is, so, so as uh, clear with the, uh, the pension camps. It has never interfered in our foreign policy, defense policy, and economic policy. And Nepal is a very much sovereign country, exercises sovereign power uh, since uh, 1950. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, Kesar, sir, briefly, and then I just uh, give this floor to the chair. He'll make a concluding remarks and also conclude this session. Uh, once you talk about the Rai, questions are but expected. Colonel Sir, I have a demand for the demand for the demand for the demand. The number of the people who are in the world are in the world. I am in the world. This is the truth. I am in the world. 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 यो सौर हमी बसेर गरी काम बो गुने बनी बेला भानु सर हमी बसेर गरूं इसलाय जानी इससे दिन मतलब टुंगे दियो ठीक होने चाहिए सुलाख से मलाई अने भाई अने यस भाई तो पहले भानु भाइयो महिले इंडिया ले स्पॉन्सर गरे को भाने के सेना तो महिले ठहमे थप दिया लो इंडिया ले स्पॉन्सर गरे बने रा � यह तो चीज़ है और कते ही ने कते बड़ा सपोर्ट नो भाई चल देने की और तेरे बुझने उनसा कुने दिन निश्चित लाल के करा हो न तो कुने बिन चल देना यो चाहिए नहीं आधार बुद्ध सिद्धांत तो यार बेबारी तो यार यही होनी हो रही है यहाँ पर ही भागो सा अब कुछ बड़ा बात सब मलिक कुछ को नाम लेको सही कहाँ बड़ो क्यों उन सब से बने करा ये तो बंदा कहीं पुक्षो ना परमाणु फोर्सिंग जरूरी चाहिए ना भाई थैंक यू थैंक यू सो गेजा सर वांस वन मिनट टू रेस्पॉन्ड टू द क्वेश्चन अबाउट ओपन बोर्डर थिंग सो प्लीज सर थैंक यू कोशिश राजी सम ऑफ द पार्टिसिपेंट टॉस्ट अपन ओपन बोर्डर एंड इट्स इम्प I am not against uh, open border, but it needs to be regulated. I think both Nepal and India agree upon through the EPG to regulate the open border, to control the uh, unwanted and illegal act, uh, cross border activities. So I think it is both uh, for Nepal and India is national interest uh, to regulate the open border, to, uh, cons to address the concerns of both Nepal and India's security concern, and to address and mitigate the security challenges that we are facing through the open border. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I want to give this floor to our chair of this session, Dr. Rajan Bhatrai. So floor is over. Thank you, Kostaraj uh, Bhai. Let me first thank to the organizer inviting me to this very vibrant session of this conference. Uh, I will not go first to the questions that was posed to me. Before going to that, I think the topic that has been selected for this afternoon's discussion seems very relevant. The panelists have given their views and what I have found, there are two issues that we need to discuss, and in each of the countries in this globe, they have to also they, they do also face both of these issues: geopolitics and security. The geopolitical issue, I think, in our context, it has become so relevant, perhaps never had it been in our history. After the rise of China and also rise of India. Our geopolitical location has drawn a lot of attention, not within our close neighbors, but also even distance friendly countries. They do have, because of this new phenomenon, the regional phenomenon, the changing global phenomenon. And I think exploring on this very relevant and very dynamic topic, we 
I think I, I must thank pan panelists. They have a very limited time. Despite that, they have brought some of the very important aspects of uh, both of these dynamics. And both of these issues, in my opinion, is that geopolitics, if you live beyond the one or two of its features, country's size, perhaps natural resources, rest of the things on geopolitics itself are very dynamic. It's not a constant thing. Same way, the security, it's very dynamic things. It's a sort of concept. It's a perception. Each of us, how do we perceive our security? What's the threat you yourself perceive? Maybe while I'm sitting here, I feel something different if I go out. If I travel in the daytime, perhaps the security perception will have been, will have much different than the, if I travel in the nighttime. So it's generally that implied to the country's perception also. How the political relations is going on, how the economic and trade relations and sort of connectivity is being handled between the countries in bilateral level that obviously have had implications, have had, you know, impacts on these security issues. The security concerns, it also times and again changes. So what in my opinion is that the important thing is the trust. Important thing is the confidence between the countries. If the trust level is increasing, if the confidence is increasing, obviously some of the even very, you know, po po prominent issue that we have thought earlier might to some extent dilute. But if that level of confidence, the gap is there, then obviously that will have a different implication. So I think in today's context, how we see in our, particularly on, a, on Nepal, in the last couple of months development, in both of our neighbors, our relations has been, with both of our neighbors, our relations has been changing. The level of confidence is building up. There are some of the irritants which were contributed to create a sort of suspicion and to create a, some sort of, you know, problem. We are resolving through the dialogue, discussions, very candid, open discussions. And if we continue towards this direction, in my opinion is that we can manage whatever gap we have and resolve the issues, whatever we, we have been facing. The Nepal, I mean, I mean, the country like Nepal, as I said, our geopolitical location, as well as the rising of our two neighbors and their expanding influences, not only in the regional level, but also in the global level, obviously, our responsibility, as many of our friends say that, when your country becomes stable, you gain some sort of confidence in your domestic front, obviously the responsibility also comes together. And that responsibility today, what is that for Nepal? The focus in our context, we need to look into that aspect, that what are the major things that to maintain good relation, while maintaining good relation to our two neighbors, maintaining, uh, while protecting our national interest, while maintaining the good relation to our neighbors. How we can do this? I think as a Nepali, as a responsible citizen, we all have to contribute for that. We need to take or we need to assure to our, both of our neighbors that our soil, our land is not threatened to us. At the same time, we need to protect our national interest. We need to protect our sovereignty. We need to protect our national independence. And if we can do that, I think that's the best way of defining our foreign policy in today's context. And that goes beyond our neighbors as well. Um, as well. I mean, we need to have extended our relations 
our strengthen our relations with the other friendly countries, the, either the, from the Asia or from Europe or in the America. So in my context is that we are moving towards this direction after the promulgation of the constitution, whatever ups and down we have, we have experienced in the past, we are trying to manage those things by avoiding this mistrust and sort of confidence gap and protecting our national interest. And that is the best way and this should be continue. And for that, I think the, our international community should also support for our, this sort of endeavors. Let me briefly touch about this issue about EPG, the Immediate Persons Group for Nepal-India Relations. That was formed two years before, and its term has already officially, its term has already been ex uh, ended by July, I think they, on July 4, 2018. But the report that we have produced, we have not been able to officially submit to the Prime Minister, respective Prime Ministers of two countries. We are about to submit it in near future. The issues that we have dealt with the report, I have not been permitted to bring it into the public. That is why I cannot say in detail about the report. But the good things I will tell you that the, all the major controversial issues, all the major, including the 1950 treaty, including the border issue, including the water resources, the utilization of Nepal's water resources issue, most of these and transit, trade, you know, socio-cultural uh, uh, relations, all these issue, issues that we have dealt in our report and what we, the report, that we, our belief that eight of us together, we have been able to produce a single report and we, our belief is that that report represents, represents the today's reality. It removes the past misunderstandings, controversies, whatever problems we had, and it gives the future way of two countries' relations in 21st century. And we hope that based on this report, the two government, because this committee was formed by the highest level, you know, the, both the prime ministers, prime minister signed the MOU, and based on that, they developed the TOR to the committee, and that committee come up with this report. So itself, the political level's ownership of this report is also very important, and our belief is that when we submit this report, we will make, if we allow, we, are, we will be permitted by the respective governments, we will make the whole report public. If not, then obviously whatever understanding they will reach, we will do based on that. In regards to this border issue, whether this is going to be regulated or whether this border will remain as it is, I cannot say exactly, but two things. Now I'm, let, let me say I'm no more a member of EPG. I'll say two things. The border that we've been talking about, the open border, that has not been as it is, as it was in the past. We see in the Indian side, the SSB now, each 3.5 kilometers, they have their stations, which was not the case in the past. That's the one example I'm just giving, very simple. The second one is, after the hijack of 1999 plane, you know, from Kathmandu to, to Afghanistan, the both countries have introduced one system, those who travel by year, to introduce either a passport, or a citizenship card, whatever you have. If certain number of citizens, those who travel by air, they have to produce something, then those citizens who travel by land, they don't have to produce anything. Can it be a sort of double rules in one country's citizens? As it happens, it has not happened anywhere. So, there are these issues we really need to address. And we have to think about coolly that how we are going to. Yes, we are very close. Our relation is very close. 
we have a very, you know, day-to-day -day affairs. Our border side peoples, they just cross over for the small things. Even some of them go for the, you know, um, health check-up. Check that is there. That means their social, cultural, day-to-day -day life is connected with it in the border side. But at the same time, we have to understand that we are two countries. We are two countries, two citizens. And in today's world, because of this, we have also been facing many problems. This issue has been coming up day, in, day after day that the security problems in the border regions, the smuggling, increasing smuggling in the border areas, and then unwanted element that are taking shelter either of the side of the countries. How we are going to make this without hampering and hindering the very traditional linkages, connect, connections, and the activities between the two countries' citizens? That is very much needed and i think this is the board uh, this is the interest of both countries and that is what we really come to a some sort of solution also thank you very much with this thank you i think with this i thank you all the panelists and also i again thank to the organizers for inviting us for this very uh, vibrant discussions especially friends from India also. We would like to thank you for traveling over here for these programs and giving your very thoughtful opinions and also the, all the participants. Thank you very much. And with these words, I hereby conclude the session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Razan Bhattrai, leader, Nepal Communist Party, and member of Eminent Persons Group uh, for chairing the session, Managing Security Dilemma, the Geopolitical Reality. Uh, may I now request Mr. Sunil Kesi, founder, CEO, Asian Institute and Diplomacy and International Affair, AIDIA, to hand over a uh, token of love to our moderator, panelist, and chairperson. May I now request Dr. Razan Watrai, leader, Nepal Communist Party, and member of EPZ, to accept token of love as a chairperson of this session. I'd also like to request Mr. Binoz Basnad, retired Army Major General Nepal, to accept token of love. I would like I'd also like to welcome Dr. Nihar R. Naik, Research Fellow, Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, IDSA, to accept token of love. I'd also like to welcome Brigadier General Kesar Bahadur Bandari, retired Secretary General, Nepal Institute for Strategic Studies, NISS, to accept token of love. I'd also like to request Dr. Constantino Javier, Fellow Foreign Policy at Brookings, India, to accept token of love. I hope I pronounced the name correctly, Dr. Constantino Javier. I'd also like to request Mr. Geza Sarma Wagle, Security and Strategic Affairs Expert, to accept token of love. I'd also like to request Mr. Samir Patil, Fellow, National Security Studies and Director, Center for International Security, Gateway House, to accept token of love. Likewise, I'd also like to request our moderator, Mr. Kusras Koidala, Political Affairs Bureau Chief, Republica English Delhi, to accept token of love. Thank you. This marks the end of our third session. Thank you, moderator, Mr. Kosras Kwerala, for moderating this session with so much ease and comfort. With this, we are heading for a 10-minute tea break, and after that, we will resume our final session. Thank you. <laughs>